Hello and welcome to this um, short class on the 1832 Reform Act and why there was a decision made by the British Parliament to change the nature of Britain's um, parliamentary um, voting um, system um, in this kind of first um, part of the, the, the 19th century. So, I'm going to start with a basic point and um, also a little bit of context and a little bit of information to kind of tie in where we left off with the classes on political or the podcast on political radicalism and what you've seen in the Peter Lou movie. So where we've left off to this point and then what comes between 1830 and 1832. So just to give you an idea that the, the point in when there is a, a decision made to uh, reform um, the electoral system and the voting system within um, Britain and these statistics here are only for England and Wales but um, these give us an idea of just how limited um, the, the kind of electorate was in 1831 um, 3% of the population were entitled to vote and that is why there was obviously this clamour for change and why there was a, a view that um, power was very much held in the hands of a very small um, proportion of society, i.e. the aristocracy, the landed nobility, were those who um, had political power and it was really just this class who had the opportunity to, 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 to vote who would represent them in Parliament and therefore who would become the governing class um, within um, Parliament that would make the vital decisions in, in, in Britain. By 1832, when we have this Great Reform Act, um, as you are very much aware, times have changed. We have got new social classes emerging, new social classes that believe that things have to change for their voices to be heard, and those classes are the middle classes and the working class. So that is also going to be part of our story, um, our story today. The next um, slide, I'm not going to run through um, necessarily in, in, in detail. What I'm going to do is really focus on the sources um, that you can see on the right hand side. I'm going to enlarge them and talk through them a little bit and um, state why they're important. Um, but just before we get to um, source 11 onwards, I want to talk um, just very quickly about where we left things off and where we're picking things up. So, you know, Peter Lou and then what followed Peter Lou was a Cato Street conspiracy that you may have read about. And what we get is a real um, crackdown on radical behaviour, radical activities from 1820 onwards. And things pick up a little bit in, in the economy in the 1820s, so there's less um, obvious um, kind of uh, problems for the working class, at least when it comes to maybe feeding their families. However, um, things that have not improved really that much. Um, and so by the time we get to 1830, there is another um, kind of movement or campaign um, again demanding the right to vote as had been the case during the, the kind of post Waterloo period with the idea that if working people got the vote this would give them the opportunity to um, have their voice heard because it could put pressure on MPs or MPs would have to listen to them listen to working class uh, views if they wanted um, elected or re-elected the middle class which we'll talk about in a second are also keen on seeing dramatic changes to the electoral system because you have got a, a new type of um, middle class who are businessmen, some big business, wealthy businessmen, mostly a lot of kind of smaller businessmen, shopkeepers, um, etc. And these individuals also want to see um, changes in the way that the, that the economy is run. They do not like the idea that the economy is always going to be um, organised in such a way that it's going to benefit the landed aristocracy. If the aristocracy are in power, then laws are going to benefit them, as we've seen with the Corn Laws of 1815. So, you get two very significant groups, working class, middle classes, who want change. And that almost kind of makes the idea of change inevitable. However, as you will see, there is great resistance to this change from within the aristocracy. Now, one thing that I would say, uh, I did mention that, you know, the 1820s is a fairly calm period. There were changes that took place during this point, so the repeal of the Combination Acts um, occurs and that gave the opportunity for, for, for workers to set up trade unions. So that may have galvanised working class desire and demands for, for change. Um, but one of the things that um, actually does open up the, the way for 
um, a return to kind of a reform or a desire for reform to be placed back on the agenda was actually internal schisms and splits amongst the ruling class, especially within the Tory party. So we might call this high politics, and it's the Whig party who take advantage of, of, of these splits and divisions. The main split and division really comes over what we call Catholic emancipation, which occurs in um, 1829. This was given um, Catholics the, the, the kind of full rights that other um, British people had, those who were members of the Church of England or Church of Scotland. And some Tories were in favour of Catholic emancipation, others were not. We have to remember that there had been a long tradition of anti-Catholicism within Britain. This was seen in the Gordon Rites, I mentioned to you back way back in, in week one, when um, violence in London erupted, when Catholic emancipation was suggested, um, you know, approximately 50 years before it actually took place. So the Whig party kind of take advantage and exploit this division within the Tory party um, over Catholic emancipation. But there's also lots of personality clashes as well, and the king dies and a new king is in place. So there's maybe the possibility, the window of opportunity for change. Why do the Whigs, who we have to remember are part of the ruling class, part of the landed aristocracy, why would they maybe favour change? Well, something we're going to have to um, to look at um, as well. But the, the Whigs are of the view that, well, maybe if you do allow some other sections of the population to vote, maybe um, maybe the Whigs could, could benefit from, from um, delivering reform and then those who benefit from reform will go on to um, uh, vote for the, the Whig party. Um, there is also something I'm going to touch on as we run through this um, this little story. Um, there is also um, not just working class trade unions, um, kind of continuation of working class kind of groups and unions who want change, but also the middle classes um, start to organise as well. All of these factors, and in addition to that, in, in Europe, um, revolution in the 1830s in, in Poland and in France and in Belgium, all these factors together make the idea of reform as a means to safeguarding aristocratic rule um, desirable. Now, I'm going to run through these sources. I'm going to start with um, source 11, but I've split source 11 into um, A, B and C. So the real, I guess, desire for change comes in the fact that the, the parliamentary system within Britain is badly in need of reform because there was um, a real issue when it came into representation. Representation of individuals, which we'll see when we look at franchise, but first and foremost, representation of areas. And you can see here that there are some parts of the country that are inadequately um, represented. Um, some of these are um, counties, some of these are town areas. And one particular area that was um, often highlighted as a as a real key reason for reform is the existence of rotten boroughs. Rotten boroughs were um, places in which there were MPs returned, but with very very small numbers of an electorate um, in place. I'm going to quote very quickly from the historian um, and Fraser here, who gives us an example. I'll, I'll just quote her directly. An example of some of these um, issues to do with rotten boroughs or unrepresentative. Um, places in, in Britain at this point. So, um, one of these rotten boroughs, the one that is often cited by historians, is a place called Old Sarum, uh, where two MPs represented quite literally a lump of stone and a green field. Which, you know, suggests that something had to change here. Um, another example was in a place called Gatton in Surrey, um, only slightly less um, unrepresentative than in Old Sarum. Um, here there were six houses in the borough and 135 inhabitants in this parish area. Um, most of these people were fairly well off. Um, the particular borough of Gatton was sold several times um, and in 1830 it was sold for £108,000. And what this really meant, if you're selling this bit of land, you are really selling the opportunity to become, um, give someone who buys the land the opportunity to become an MP. If you own the land and you really therefore influence all the people who live within this area and within this land, then you really have an opportunity to um, ensure that you get the votes that you required. Um, so you've got a, a, a real kind of system that is um, um, badly in need of, of reform. There's another example I'll give you quickly. Dunwich and Suffolk um, had basically fallen into the sea, right? But it was still regarded as being a, a, an old traditional part of the country and therefore still required um, electoral representation. Um, it still returned two members 
um, to, to Parliament. There are a number of these types of examples where um, basically you had boroughs that existed but hardly any voters within them. In fact, the bottom point of um, number three on this source um, says altogether there were 56 boroughs which had less than 40 voters each. Now, this issue is made even more galling by the fact that in industrial northern Britain there were towns, cities much larger that had either no representation or the same representation. So the second um, bullet point there says, in the Midlands and the north of England, um, expanding towns like Manchester, Birmingham, Leeds and Sheffield did not have their own MPs. These areas were represented by um, county MPs and these county MPs were obviously aristocrats who really did not know or have much um, idea of what was going on in these new industrial cities like Manchester, Birmingham, um, etc. So something something had to change, right? You had to you know, get away with these small counties um, and, and, and kind of bring about a, a kind of more fair and equal uh, form of constituencies, a bit more like what we have uh, um, today. Now the other issue was the franchise. Now this is the major issue. I'm not going to overcomplicate this, but if we move on to the next um, slide, and the next um, the next kind of set of sources, we're talking about who had the right to vote. These bullet points here, one to five, really tells about the complexity of the system. All these different types of boroughs, and within different types of boroughs across the country, different people had the right to vote. Um, what we really just want to take from this is, and we know because I've just mentioned it, you know, we're talking about three uh, percent of the electorate having the right to vote. Who did not have the right to vote? Well, the working class could not vote and the vast majority of the middle class could not vote. If you were a welfare enough factory owner, you could probably buy yourself a seat somewhere. But on the whole, um, and therefore you could become an MP, but on the whole, um, we see um, a system which is very much one based on um, the aristocracy being in power and the aristocracy voting other members of the aristocracy into, into power. So, a fairer electoral system, give the vote to the middle class, give the vote to the working class, it was suggested, would mean that the aristocracy would have to change their ways or possibly face uh, losing seats because uh, middle class candidates and working class candidates uh, could take their place, although um, there was no discussion or debate at this point about paying MPs, so the idea of working class or most middle class um, kind of um, voters ever becoming MPs seemed highly unlikely. Um, finally, political corruption, which I've, I've kind of touched on um, already. There was a real opportunity to kind of buy and sell um, seats, um, and that um, is something that happened in these smaller um, constituencies, um, especially in the south of, of the country. So, here is the, the kind of belief, or the belief that um, reform is needed, um, based on these um, points. Um, and then um, we get the reality. So, although there was a, a demand for change, although um, places like Old Serum, you know, had seven voters and two MPs, um, there's no guarantee that, you know, what seemed like a very um, obvious uh, requirement for change, there's no guarantee that this would be bought or accepted by the ruling class, right? Why would the ruling class vote to change a system that benefits them? Right? I'm just going to uh, read through some of these um, sources. Um, source 12 uh, comes from the um, well-known, by this point to yourself, Edmund Buck, famous um, politician but also writer, um, who had kind of opposed Tom Paine's uh, rights of man and Buck eventually kind of opposed them, um, the French Revolution. Um, this little quote from Buck, a bit before our time, right? So we're, we're a bit earlier here than 1830, but in 1790, Buck says, and we know that the House of Commons, uh, without shutting its doors to any merit in any class, is by sure operation of adequate causes, filled with everything illustrious in rank, in descent, in hereditary, and in acquired opulence, in cultivated talents, military, civil, naval, political distinction that the country can afford. What Buck is really saying here is, we don't need to change things because we have got everything that we need. Everything that is good about Britain uh, is, is kind of represented within the House of Commons. And um, therefore, Britain should be proud of their, their kind of aristocratic state. It makes this in 1790 when obviously there's real pressure perhaps to change with the um, beginnings of the French Revolution and the fear of um, ideas in France 
um, as I've mentioned before, crossing the channel. So here is um, here's a kind of viewpoint that um, persists amongst the ruling class. Um, the uh, Lord Liverpool, soon to be Tory Prime Minister, he says um, never was there um, a period in our history when the representation of the people of Parliament was less than equal. So he's even saying, well, do you know what? There's maybe even the odd kind of new wealth within Parliament and. For those of you who can recall the, um, the story of William Wilberforce, and if you did watch the Wilberforce movie, Wilberforce himself was not one of the traditional landed aristocracy. He was more of your kind of new landed gentry who'd made his money through trade and uh, as a kind of part of this merchant class. So for Lord Liverpool, that was a sign of progress. Here's, here's um, interlopers who are now part of the system. And then the Duke of Wellington, now he's speaking as late as 1830, in fact, Wellington is part of the story. Um, he's Prime Minister at this point. He says that um, the House of um, Lords uh, was fully convinced that the country possessed at the present moment a legislator which answered all the good purposes of legislation. So things were fine. Why, um, why bring about change? Now, um, the Duke of Wellington was known to be um, a reactionary and therefore um, there's no real surprise that he was of this of this view. Um, but what we um, what we see is that Buck and Liverpool and, and Wellington, um, who think that old Serum and Gatton and these places that I men mentioned, they believe that to quote um, Source 13 that these were um, endearing eccentricities of an evolving political system. They believe that change might come, but that change will be gradual and but for them gradual you know could be 50 years 100 years they think that the system is fine and that's partly because towards the end of um, source 13 partly because they believe in this concept of virtual representation now the concept of virtual representation had already been applied to the american colonies it didn't work out there where the american colonies said you're not virtually represented stop taxing us because we um, should not be taxed without representation the idea of virtual representation still existed in Britain, the view was, okay, the working class can't vote, but that's okay because there are people within Parliament who will represent them, the workers, um, with what they say and do within in the House of Commons. Complete and absolute nonsense because we know what the aristocracy's view was of the working class. We saw that perfectly with how the workers were treated um, at Peterloo. So, um, they, the Tories, the aristocracy, are kind of clinging on to power at this point, um, and it's going to change in 18. It's going to change in 1830. Now, I'm going to um, kind of shift the, the, the kind of debate away or discussion away um, a little bit from Parliament for this source, and, and I want to focus on um, the press and um, the press's relationship with the Whig Party. Now, for those of you who can recall the Peter Lowe movie, right towards the end, a journalist appears. That journalist is Edward Baines who was a supporter of parliamentary reform, someone who believed that Henry Hunt uh, and his speeches would be ideal in providing the change that was required to reform the country. And Baines writes about Peter Lowe. By the time we get to 1831, Baines looks like he's um, become a bit more of a moderate, or maybe more of a pragmatist, it depends on what you think. Um, but what, what we get here is that this is a, a letter um, from Lord John Russell, um, to Edward Baines, the editor of the Leeds Mercury, right, and he asked Baines, you know, can you can you tell us really what the impact would be of um, basically allowing people to vote who can pay ten pound a year in property. So if somebody owns ten pound worth of property, a house or someone who rents for that price. So Baines gets back to Russell, and um, he tells them on the seventh of November, eighteen seventy, uh, sorry, eighteen thirty one. He says to him, okay, do not worry. He says, my research has shown in Leeds that those who will be enfranchised with this new £10 ruling would be comparatively few people. So you're not really increasing the electorate by that much. And the majority of people who would be in this position would be the middle classes. And he lists the different types of people. And he says that, you know, the number of um, people voting leads would not increase dramatically. And um, what, what you're really getting is, is, is kind of reform that 
seems to be fairly safe. And that was what the Whig Party, Lord John Russell, uh, being uh, a member of this party, that was really what they wanted to hear. That middle class radicals were, were okay. The idea that the working class would, you know, would, would get the vote in this instance, that may have put fear into the, the Whigs. But based on what Ben says here, that's not going to be um, the case. Which takes us to Parliament, and on this occasion I want to take you to um, where it says um, Source 16. And here we have got um, a fairly famous speech by um, the Whig MP Macaulay, um, Thomas Macaulay, um, who was all, also a, a, a historian. Um, and Macaulay makes a speech in Parliament where he says that if we do reform, I should say this date is also um, 1831, right, a little bit before, a little bit before Baines's um, research. But what Macaulay says is, look, if we have reform, it can be reform that is preserved. So make these little changes now, and then we don't have to worry about changing the system again. It's kind of something that we um, won't have to deal with again in this lifetime. So what Macaulay does and, and says is, if you give the middle classes the vote, some of the middle classes the vote, then that should be enough to keep them content. That should be enough to make them feel part of the nation, right? As the source says at the very top, you know, admit the middle classes to a large and uh, direct share in the representation, and this would avoid any violent shock to the institutions of our country. He says, um, I say, sir, there are countries in which the condition um, of the labouring classes is such that they may safely be entrusted with the right of giving them the vote. That's America uh, at this point, some parts of Europe. But that's not the case in, in Britain. He says they can't trust the working class within Britain. They are too radical. Um, their wages aren't high enough. Um, they are um, likely to riot um, on occasion. Um, we just can't. We just can't take that 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 risk. Uh, and therefore, um, if we did give them the vote, can we really trust them because they don't have the education and the ability to make sensible decisions because they don't own property? So let's just give, let's just give the vote to people who have property. So you kind of see the pragmatic view that emerges within the Whig Party. Um, it's seen even more so in Source 17, which is on the same page, also from 1831. Um, here we see um, a diary, or a sequence of diary extracts from John Campbell, um, a Whig MP. And he starts off in February saying, no reform, no reform. And as things progress and progress, within the space of a, um, space of a month, and as there is a fear that there might be some type of potential working class and middle class um, unity or union that could force reform upon Parliament, then Campbell starts to think, you know what, I think it's probably better. He says that I think the bill is still dangerously violent. He says this on March the 8th. But apprehend less danger from passing it than rejecting it. Because um, there is a bill put to Parliament by this point. Um, and the Whigs are the ones who are pushing it. Here's a Whig MP who has to decide is he going to support it or not. And he decides he's going to support it. The bill is put forward by uh, Lord um, Errol Grey, who I'll talk about in a moment. And um, here we see Whigs, Macaulay, Russell, and now Campbell, all deciding to get behind this bill because they think its um, moderate nature will be good for the country uh, in the long run and it will, will calm down any talk of more radical um, reform. Now, let's look at the, so that's the kind of top-down approach, right, the, the politicians and what, what their views are. What about um, the view from the bottom up? Now, I did mention that there were political unions. These political unions um, came from the middle class and from the working class. The um, middle class unions are known as the BPU, right, the Birmingham Political Union, which was led by um, a guy called Thomas um, Atwood. And Atwood was um, very much of the belief that um, it was essential for middle class people to get the vote because, as I mentioned earlier, they could then 
have a greater say in terms of how the economy would run and let's face it the middle classes were very much the instigators of this new capitalist economy therefore it would make sense for them to have political representation but you also had working class unions the most famous one being the NUWC that you can see referred to here the National Union of the Working Class and there's another union on the right hand side you can see the NPU the National Political Union which was a combination of the middle classes and the working class now the NUWC are not so keen on an alliance with the middle classes because they don't trust the middle classes and they believe that workers um, will be left out of any legislation that might be passed. So if you really want to read the aims of the NUWC, you can do so in Soul Society and their aims are for a more radical change than what the BPU would face under Thomas, uh, or what Thomas that would, would, would demand. And then um, Sir Francis Burdett, who you read about in Source 20, um, believes in trying to bring the working class and, and middle classes closer together, that they should recognise they've got similar, um, get similar interests. Um, and Atwood, to some extent, had that view. He believed, well, it wouldn't do any harm for these middle class unions to have the, the potential force of the working class behind them to convince um, Parliament to reform. Um, to some extent, you could argue that they kind of take advantage of the working classes because they can say, well, well um, we don't really care if the working class don't get the vote, but if they're on our side initially, that may be enough to put fear in the aristocracy who then decide it's better to give the middle classes a vote to support this alliance, um, and therefore um, they can um, they can you know pass some type of moderate um, change. I should maybe say that the NUWC were not necessarily your kind of industrial um, kind of factory workers who are coming up with these ideas about pushing for reform, they are also going to benefit from it, but it's actually your more kind of artisan, slightly more skilled, wealthy members of the working class in places like London who come up with the idea of you know pushing for reform again um, by the 1830s. And as I mentioned, context as well um, of revolution in Europe does also add to the fear um, that the um, aristocracy is kind of experiencing at this point. So fear of a working class, middle class, united approach, united front, as well as just kind of a general sense that things were changing within um, the world. Um, so that is um, where we're kind of at um, in 1831, a desire for um, a desire for change, um, with only kind of the most staunch Tories being opposed to it, and um, as we'll see, the House of Lords. So the Reform Bill um, does uh, get put forward in 1831, it's rejected, um, I should say, mostly by Tories. Um, it's proposed by, uh, in March 1831, by the Whig government, Lord L. Grey, uh, suggested that there should be um, a disenfranchisement of some of these boroughs that we spoke about, abolition, um, uh, some seats completely, these ones that you know have only got um, a handful of voters, redistribute, redistribute seats uh, to large towns, and um, all of this would probably increase the electorate by half a million. So, obviously fairly moderate. It fails to pass Parliament, so the Prime Minister, um, Earl Grey, is forced to go back to the polls in the summer of 1831. So the bill um, is brought back again after the election, um, an election which the Whigs win, which means they can um, get their um, vote hopefully through because they've got more seats. It's a little bit like what happened uh, with the Tories regarding the, the Brexit bill had to have another election to make sure they could get the seats um, that they needed to kind of get their Brexit bill passed. So the bill does pass in September of 1831, however the House of Lords rejected it. So some historians, including E.P. Thompson, who um, I've already referred to in previous classes, historians argue that Britain is maybe as close to some type of revolution in 1831 in October um, September 1831 than at any other point in her history. Because here was angry middle classes that the aristocratic House of Lords had rejected a bill and here were the working classes rioting in places like Bristol because the working classes believed, those who supported the reform bill, believed that the passage of it would be a wedge. And what I mean by that is you wedge the door open and once the door of reform is open it's never going to close again and it wouldn't be long until the working class would be the next section of society that would benefit from um, change. So the um, the kind of situation we get in 
Britain has become to the end of 1831 is, is one of the potential for chaos and disorder. I should have said it in Source 21. If you go back to it, you will see um, a little reference to the Bristol riots and um, this kind of fear of middle class, modern class alliance that is referred to in this um, Source 20 um, means that uh, Parliament um, was um, concerned about what might happen. And there was a desire actually to uh, do something which was also mentioned um, recently, which was to prorogue Parliament. Um, pro parliament. Um, now, in December 1831, we have um, a new parliament, so another um, vote, and um, what we get is um, a, a kind of problem for the, the government because um, Earl Grey, who had been obviously the Prime Minister, um, wanted the House of Lords to you know, stop um, their, their kind of games of refusing to pass the law. Grey goes to the king and says to the king, um, you need to appoint more peers um, to the House of Lords that are pro-reform. The king was reluctant to do this, didn't, didn't really want to do that, so Grey resigns. When Grey resigns, the kind of anti-reformist Duke of Wellington is back in power, and then we get in the early part of um, 1832, right through until May 1832, um, more um, views that there could be serious um, violence if there was not um, reform of the system. In fact we refer to this period in May as the days of May when the middle classes say they're going to refuse to pay their taxes, they're going to have a run on the banks, take all their money at the banks, they're going to call for the abolition of the House of Lords. That pressure that comes from the BPU and the working class political unions eventually forces the King to bring Grey back, remove Wellington, appoint more peers and the Reform Act is eventually passed in 1832. Did it benefit the working class? Well, Source 22 shows us that no, it doesn't. The Poor Man's Guardian newspaper in October 1832 reports on the, the passing of the Reform Act and um, makes a point that many working class radicals have been saying, which was um, the middle classes will, will sell us out. In fact, this is referred to in the source where he talks about, you know, the bill was an, in effect an invitation to the shoplocrats, that's the middle classes, of the enfranchised towns to join with the wiggle cats of the, the country, so that's your kind of landed gentry, and um, in the process keep the common cause um, of keeping the people down, i.e. keeping the workers down, um, if you could um, unite the middle classes with the aristocracy. And that's that's kind of what happens, don't get me wrong, there are some middle class politicians like Thomas Atwood who do go into Parliament and will put forward bills to try and get the working class to vote. We'll talk about that when we look at the Chartist movement in our next um, story. But the working class do feel betrayed by the, the Reform Act passed in 1832 that they had been left out of this um, story. And um, as I've, you can see scribbled on the right, this Reform Act did much to finally separate the working class from the middle class radicals. And we now really see Britain as being a three class society working class, middle class and aristocracy, I know that's a simplification, but it's a good way to look at things for the remainder of um, the, the 19th um, century. Okay, so short and sweet, not much to this um, lesson, um, but the 1832 reform is an important um, period in British history, it's a period when lots of reforms take taken place, 1829 Catholic Emancipation Act, 1834 Poor Law Reform Act, 1832 Reform Act, there's also been uh, reform to local governments during this period as well. If you go back a little bit further, um, uh, 1829 as well, you've got the establishment of the Metropolitan Police, something we'll get to in future. So there's a lot of changes taking place within Britain at this point, but most of these changes benefit the middle classes, and the middle classes from this point onwards are going to have uh, more power, and that's only going to increase and increase as the, the century um, progresses. The story of the working class and where they fit into this is something that we'll have to examine um, again, and that will um, come under our next topic of Chartism. But for now, thank you.